Hello and welcome back to Cracking the Cryptic. Now today, um, something people have been waiting for, a bit of a marathon undertaking, but I'm going to talk you through a Sudoku puzzle hunt by Ben Needham, the um, rather astonishing puzzle hunt that Ben created for us and that we put up on our Patreon page, um, feels like six weeks ago, I want to say. So what we did was we put up this page, um, our first Sudoku puzzle hunt. We're absolutely thrilled to bring this to you. Um, when was it? May the 3rd. So not six weeks ago, eight, no, only a month ago. Good Lord, feels longer. So there we go. We, we published this puzzle hunt and um, it was very popular, but it was very hard. It took a long time, even for good solvers to get through this. What I'm going to do today, I'm not going to solve each of the nine puzzles fully. I'm going to explain how the hunt worked, how to how one was able to progress through it. I will leave you to be able to solve the puzzles yourself if you want to at some point. A couple of the comments that have been kind of the remaining ones of the uh, 300 odd that we've had uh, refer to problems on lascivious queens, which was one of the puzzles that we'll see and what do the star symbols mean in many of the cells? Well, the first thing to say about puzzle hunts generally is that they don't give as much information as a standard Sudoku rule set to say. So the beginning of the puzzle hunt was this page, a guide to your journey, which explained that the contents of circled cells are to be used to fill the equivalent cells in the next puzzle. However, the order of puzzles is to be deduced. Now that's a huge however there. So the puzzles in the order they're presented in this document aren't necessarily useful for you. Now, in each puzzle, one cell is marked with a hash, or in one case, two cells, which should be read together as a pair. The contents of these cells read in the correct order provide an additional hint to the theme. And the final solution to the hunt is a single nine letter English word. Okay, I mean, that's something, but it's not a lot. Then the individual puzzles do have some instructions. So they say the normal kind of Sudoku instructions, normal Sudoku rules apply. In addition, each thermometer here must strictly increase along its length from the bulb. That's fairly normal. Um, so we've got puzzles with actual instructions. This one's got a lot of different instructions, but we don't know the order of the puzzles. There are these stars in the cells, as several people pointed out, and we haven't been told anything about them. We kind of understand the circles. Um, we don't know if colors are gonna matter necessarily. We don't know what these titles mean of each of the puzzles. This puzzle is completely empty. Like unless, and it's just normal Sudoku rules apply. So. There's an awful lot to do here and an awful lot to figure out as we go along. So the way to go about the hunt in general was actually to start with, to just have a go at the puzzles and see which ones could get close to a solution or to a solution. If we're reading the rules right at the beginning, um, the order of puzzles is to be determined and the contents of the circled cells are to be used to fill the equivalent cells in the next puzzle. So there seems to be a fair chance that one of the puzzles will be solvable entirely on its own. And that does turn out to be the case. Although you could, with great skill, make a fair amount of progress both in a raging temperature and in forged letters. Um, the one that actually you could really get somewhere in and get close to a finish is this puzzle. It's up in the air. Now, let's. Um, what I'm going to do is kind of switch to the web solving version that we provided on the link here. So let's go back to the internet. And this is It's Up in the Air. Now, on these versions we provided, the stars and hashes and circled cells are not marked, but they are marked on the paper. We can come back to those later. So this is It's Up in the Air. And I've got my crib sheet here. And this one is Normal Sudoku Rules Apply. Each of the four shaded regions is either 
a palindromic sequence from end to end, or a clone of one of the other three regions, that is, a pure rotation with translation without flipping. So what this means, you can see all these regions are kind of the same shape. So you could rotate this red one round onto the blue one. And that might mean it could be a clone, in which case this cell would be the same as this cell. Ah, but wait, this cell would be the same as this cell. So those two can't be clones of each other. The same applies up here. These ones are symmetric. This cell, is it no, this cell would be the same as this cell. So those can't be clones of each other. Um, so ones that are next to each other can never be clones of each other. Now, the other thing to notice here is that the cells in the northwest and the southeast, or the shapes, I mean, in the northwest and southeast, can't be palindromes because they have two cells that would be palindromically the same. A palindrome is obviously a sequence of digits which is the same backwards as forwards. And these two cells, just as up there, would have to be the same, and they're in the same box. Now, we know normal Sudoku rules apply, so that's impossible. So, these two can't be, palindr can't be um, palindromes, and clones can never be next to each other. And that will tell us that the green and blue shapes are palindromes, and the yellow and red shapes are clones. It has to be. That's the only way this can be. And once you know that, you can approach the start of solving this puzzle. So, you know, if I was beginning this and I'm not going to solve the whole puzzle, seven and six, for instance, I'd see would have to be there in that box. We'd have one, eight, two through the middle. That would be eight. And we'd have one, two there. Then we're going to have three, four or nine. Now, what we know is that the green shape is a palindrome. So to have three, four or nine here, would mean it has to be the same as here. We can rule out three from that because it's in the same box and that reduces what we have. So gradually you could make the same sort of deductions again here. This couldn't be a, th sorry, that should be four or nine. And again here, this one is a palindrome and those two cells have to be the same. Again, they're four or nine. And suddenly we've got a four nine pair in the central row and we can place a three. So you can make these deductions, especially based on the palindrome, um, but also based on the clones where this cell has to be the same as this one. And this one has to be the same as this one, etc. And those are pretty powerful constraints in some cases. So there were ways to make progress with this. Uh, we get a five there, for instance. And gradually you would be able to fill this um, grid in. And unlike some of the other grids, which you could crack away at and make some deductions in, um, this one goes all the way to a finish. So the feeling is that that now has to be the first of the puzzles in the sequence. So you'd kind of note down that it's up in the air is the first puzzle. And then what you do is go back to the document, look at these circled cells and try and match them to other puzzles. And it turns out that if you try and match what you now have in these circled cells to the same positions in other puzzles, let's just randomly try it. So we have a nine in the top left and a nine here and two here. So those are kind of new digits for this for this puzzle. And then one and nine, they're circled as well. So there's quite a few clues there. And if we try and match them, I haven't tested this out, but let's try and match them to uh, not that one, which has nothing, not that one. Let's match them to something which has got some uh, numbers in it. So if you try and match them to this puzzle, for instance, you immediately have a clash with a one here in column five, and there's a one down there. So you can gradually rule those out. With, num with puzzles like, um, you can't really do anything with hypocrisy. You kind of have to assume this might well be the last puzzle, but you don't know how 
you know, you can put in three or five digits, but you still couldn't possibly solve it as a normal Sudoku. So let's ignore that one for the moment. You can actually gradually work out that with those digits placed in this sandwich puzzle, it wouldn't work. And, um, you know, there are ways you would learn about these other puzzles as you went along. Again, in this killer, those digits wouldn't actually work because of some of what they are. I mean, they just would break the puzzle very quickly. So it's a learning experience. You have to kind of test them all out. But what you would find is that the digits match quite well with this puzzle, Lascivious Queens. And therefore, this was the next one to fill in. And once you fill in all the numbers that you've been given, you get to this grid. And the rules of Lascivious Queens are that normal Sudoku rules apply as usual. In addition, the Queen rule applies to the digits four to nine. So for each of the digits four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, they must appear at most once in any given diagonal. Now, that is actually my first thought is that's quite astonishing. I didn't know a queen puzzle could be made that worked for six of the nine digits. I know that you can't make a queen puzzle that works for all the digits. I didn't realize you could get as many as six digits obeying queen rules. So my first thought on seeing this was that grid must be pretty constrained in some way. And that was quite prescient. But what you can do is maybe start with the nines and I will take you a little way through the solving of this puzzle because it is not easy. So often the best thing to do with a queen puzzle is to color the cells that cannot possibly contain the particular queen. And in this case, we're looking at nines to start with. So those other cells in its, bo in its boxes can't possibly contain nine nor can the cells in the columns with nines in. And also we can mark all the diagonals that these nines can see. So this one gets that and that and that. This one gets that, that, that and that. So we can color all of those cells green and also any remaining cells that aren't nines because obviously they can't contain a nine. And now we can see where to put a nine in box six over here. Clearly that's the only empty cell. So that's quite interesting. That in turn rules out quite a number of other cells that it can see as a queen, including this one. So we can color those green. Now, a really good technique with nine puzzles, uh, with queen puzzles, sorry, is to identify places which have limited queens and in which both or all three of the queen's possibilities see one cell. So here in the central box, we've got two possibilities, but they clearly both see this cell, even by normal Sudoku rules. Now by queen Sudoku rules, they also see this cell, one on the diagonal and one straight. The same's true here. We've got these two and they both can see this cell. So that means that suddenly now we've got these two in box eight, the queen must be in one of those, and they would both see this cell. So we are gradually reducing the possibilities. Now here, we've got queens in one of those two cells. They can clearly both see this cell, one on the diagonal and one straight, as usual. These two both see this cell. Now this one is a queen and it sees this one. Now we can rule out, now this one is a queen, so we can rule out those. And suddenly we're down to just a single position for the nines in the grid. So then you could fill in the nines. That's how Queen Sudoku works, basically. So then you would kind of empty out the grid of all the shading. Um, yes, we don't have a control for this at the moment, but with a tiny bit of touchpad control, we can go reasonably fast, thank God. So all white again, and then we have to choose another digit to work on the queen restriction. So again, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Now we've got three fives in the grid. So that looks like the most promising thing to do. And again, you can place all the fives in the grid. So um, it's a little bit, Actually, I think it was, let's have a go at it. It, it. I think it was a little bit easier for the fives, although I might be misremembering. Let's see. 
all of these are in boxes, rows or columns with those five. So let's make them all green. So then we get this pattern. OK, there's a few cells that have got numbers in that clearly aren't five. So we can do them as well. Now, this five is seeing this one on the diagonal. So we can place another five here. Now, this five is seeing all of those. Uh, it's picking up that on the diagonal. That's the only extra cell that we can rule out there. Now, we still have quite a few cells, uh, but I haven't marked in the diagonals for some of these. So once we do that, it gets a bit more interesting. We get several cells reduced. This one, very interesting. This five's on the long diagonal, so it's picking up those. Those are all green. Clearly, there's only one space left in this central box. That's seeing both of these and that and those and even that. And this is pretty straightforward now. So we can place all the fives very quickly. And they're obeying the queen's constraint as well. Now, at this point, this puzzle gets considerably harder because there's only one seven, one eight, one four, and no sixes in the grid at all. So those are the other digits that obey the queen's rule, and we've got very little help for them. Um, it really is tricky. Oh, I've forgotten to actually place the numbers that we got have I? Yeah, from the original puzzle. So the first puzzle gave us a two here. Maybe I've just missed the one of them out, actually. So that two was from the first puzzle. Uh, five, four, three, two. Yes, sorry about that. So anyway, that two was very useful. We finally can do some ordinary Sudoku and put a two in here because of that two and that two. And similarly with ones, we can place a one in the central box. And it turns out that this pattern in the central box is very useful. This has to be eight, seven, and six, and they all obey queen constraints because every number from four to nine does. Now, that's useful because they can see both of these cells. These three cells all can see both of those cells. So those cells couldn't be six, seven, or eight. They have to be a three, four pair. This one is now clearly the same as this cell. So if we make them red, we can start looking around the grid using the queen rule for how to rule out possibilities. And it might take some bifurcation at this point. It might take kind of finding your way through. In fact, down in this box, that cell, that cell, and on the diagonal, those cells are ruled out. So red is restricted to one of those two, which puts it up here somewhere. And gradually you do begin to eliminate all the possibilities. Then it becomes those two and therefore this cell. And suddenly this box is quite restricted. One of those two. And again, you can kind of follow this round. You don't know what number this is. Actually, that's not a restriction that applies because that seven is possible. So I shouldn't have done those. Um, or rather, I should have left those both red because they are restricted. So what you can do is basically work out what all the various possibilities are. And gradually you were able to fill in sevens, eights and sixes in this grid and work towards the finish. It's difficult, but those are the techniques that you do have to use in this puzzle. Um, and there are shortcuts. Now, we're not ex we weren't expecting people to use these, but a lot of people noticed that this grid is displaying some very interesting symmetry. And some of that is exemplified by the fact that if you look at the corners, you've got odd digits in all the corners and you've got a one opposite a three. And now if you start looking for any threes you've got in the grid, oh look, there's only one and it's opposite a one. Five is opposite nine. Now we've placed all the fives and nines. Once you start highlighting the fives and nines, you can see that they're symmetrically opposite each other throughout the grid. And this was very useful. Again, going back to the idea that this puzzle must have been extremely hard to set, must have used an extremely restricted possibility for a grid to get six digits obeying all of the Queen's rules. 
Um, it's worth noting that symmetry is quite likely to be maintained throughout once it is um, noted for these numbers. So that was one way that you could actually make some progress without necessarily going down the laborious paths of finding all the queens individually, which I have explained how you can do, and I'm not going to do it fully here. Now, there is another thing about this grid. You might notice that the diagonals so far, well, even though they're very well filled in, they all have different digits, 9712385. So is there a reasonable chance, again, in a very constrained grid, this might have to obey diagonal constraints too, with a four and a six in those two remaining cells. Again, up here, three, five, four, two, nine, one. This one has to be eight, seven, or six. So again, it's looking like there's a fair chance that this obeys diagonal rule constraints as well as the symmetry constraint. And with all of those tools at your disposal, you could jump to the solution. Now, I really wouldn't recommend this in a regular Sudoku unless you're against the clock or solving it for some other purpose. It certainly isn't a way of testing whether a Sudoku works. We recently had a brilliant puzzle by Ard van der Wettering, which looked like it was going to be symmetrical and then turned out not to be, which is a good salutary lesson. But if you did use any of the techniques and come up with the solution to this puzzle, which was this, it turned out that the diagonal constraint did apply, the symmetry constraint did apply, and this was the final position. A very tough puzzle. Everybody who solved the uh, hunt absolutely acknowledged that this was the hardest one. But that done, we could go back to the document, identify the circles, get quite a few from this puzzle, and find out which grid they then fitted. Now, as we go through the hunt, the available leaving this one aside again, the available puzzles that those numbers could fit in um, begin to shrink. And it turns out that these numbers would fit into Hungry for Sandwiches, which is the next puzzle in this hunt. So we will go on to that puzzle. Now, in Hungry for Sandwiches, I filled in the digits that we got from Lascivious Queens. And this is a sandwich Sudoku with a difference in that the numbers outside the grid are either the sum of the digits between the one and the nine in that row or column, or the sum of the digits between the three and the eight in that row or column. Now, that seems to kind of throw the whole thing into confusion because you don't know whether zero means that one and nine are next to each other or three and eight. But in fact, the puzzle has been very carefully constructed, so you do get quite a lot of clues. Now, the first thing to note is that the sum of the digits that can come between 1 and 9 is 35, and the sum of the digits that can come between 3 and 8 is 34. Now, that means that where there is a 35 total, it could never be a 3 and 8 that it's referring to. It must always be a 1 and 9, and given where the 35 totals are in this puzzle, you can immediately place 1, 9 pairs in all the corners. Um, the clues have been very carefully set up as well, so they're always opposite each other. So in every row and column in which there's a clue, there's clearly a 1-9 clue, and because it's different the other end, a 3-8 clue. So that's very useful too. So once you know that the 35 here is referring to the 1s and 9s, then you know that this 7 means that there's a total of 7 between the 3 and 8 in this row. Now, 34, that can never be a clue in a 1-9 sandwich because you can't get any seven of the digits between 2 and 9 to add up to 34. So that has to be a 3 and 8, and you can put them on the outside again. And now you know that in this column, the 13 is a sandwich clue for the 1 and 9. So where can the 1 go? Well, in fact, it's all very restricted. There's a 1 here and a 1 here, so all of these cells are ruled out. There's got to be 13 between the 9 and this 1, so it clearly can't be here or here. And we can put in a 1 here. And that's one of the ways to make progress here. So 1 up in box 4 would have to be in one of those two cells. Now you'd be looking at this 3 clue down here. Now, you don't know if that's referring to a 1-9 sandwich, in which case they'd have to be either side of the 3. That's clearly possible. 
But is it referring to a 13 sandwich clue? In which case, 8 and 3 would have to have... Third, uh, would, sorry, if the 3 was referring to an 8 and 3 sandwich, you'd have to have a 2 and a 1 between them. Now, that's not possible given these 1s. So you do work that one out fairly quickly. This must be 1 here and 9 here. The 3 is a clue in the 1-9 sandwich. And the 13 is a clue in the 8-3 sandwich. So you can actually fill in a 4 here. And that's how this puzzle begins to unfold. So very clever bit of setting. You know, really neat use of all of those puzzles, of all of those uh, constraints. And when you've solved this puzzle, which wasn't too hard in the end, you get to this grid, which again gives you some numbers in circles to take on to the document to look around for the various um, puzzle that the, sorry, where were the circles? So you've got quite a lot. You've got five, six, seven, eight circles from that one that you can apply to the other puzzles. And it turns out that the one that they apply to is this one, which had a lot of uh, givens in it as well. And none of the givens in the hungry puzzle clash with the over greedy puzzle. So you can start this puzzle off. And once you've got the, the blue numbers of the circled ones filled in, you get this. Now this puzzle looked a bit better in the document than on our app because of the difficulties of of the shading in the corners. So apologies about that. The, the principle of the puzzle is that there are extra regions. There are nine, six, sorry, there are six in the puzzle. So the purple cells here form an extra region across the three middle boxes with the red cells. And an extra region means that the numbers in it have to be each of the numbers from one to nine. So you can see that from the row in the red cells, these have to be seven, eight, and nine. We've already got one and five in the perimeters, so we've got to put a two and three in. They can't go here because there's two and three in the box, so they have to go here. So you can immediately write in the two and three. Now the other items in the extra region are four and six. They've got to go here. And you can actually reduce some of these possibilities. Which one of these red cells can be nine? It's got to be this one because of the nines in the others and we're down to a couple of eight, seven pairs in these boxes, and loads of digits filled in. Again, down the middle, what can you do here? It's not quite the same because you don't know what's in the red cells, but this run of three has to be a nine, eight, seven triple because of five, four, two, one in its column and six, three in its box. So again, eight and seven are there somewhere, and these two are a three, six pair. And you can work this kind of logic around this grid. I think this puzzle is actually about the easiest of the puzzles in the hunt, which is not to say that it was a giveaway in any sense, but it was quite manageable as long as you kept your head around the various logic. The reason the cells are red rather than purple in this um, extra region is because they also apply, for instance, this one's used in the yellow extra region, etc. So an intriguing use of extra regions. And again, we would get some, I think this was the answer to the extra region puzzle. And again, we got some letters, uh, some, some numbers circled to take on to the next puzzle, which let me just check my um, crib sheet. Now that was a raging temperature. Now this was quite interesting. This was one of the two puzzles that you could actually worry away at without any extra numbers supplied and make some serious headway in. Um, probably not helpful on the document, the thermos are in black. I think in our version, yeah, we made them gray. So once you put in, oh, I've again not put in the numbers that we were given from the other puzzle. So you get a one here and a seven here, which is very nice. Um, eight and four, six there, five there. Now, intriguingly, almost all of those you could actually have achieved from just working on the thermo puzzle as a, as a basic thermo. Um, 
And I mean, it's this is a tricky puzzle, but you could get a long way. Now that was an eight from the earlier puzzle. So you've got all of these possibilities. Now in this thermo, for instance, something higher than seven has to be at the end of it. So that's an easy write in as a nine. Um, this thermo, actually this one's been given an eight just near its end. So you know that the last number in it must be a nine point of these thermometers is they have to increase as you go along them. Now, this can't have a seven here because there's a seven there and it's got to be less than eight. And then you've got to fit other numbers descending up the thermometer. So that's actually a straight write in of five, four, three, two, one. And again, progress can be made. Now, that leaves this as a two or three, this is a seven or eight. And, you know, this is how this puzzle gradually unfolded. Um, it wasn't easy. This was still a pretty tricky puzzle. You needed all of the little thermometers reaching into the middle. Uh, there was a bit of kind of tripling, I think, in the middle in the end. And the eventual solution looked like, th uh, the, sorry, that's the version with the digits given. And the eventual solution looked like this. So that was quite a tough one but we really are reducing the numbers of puzzles. There's only four left to do after this, so it's becoming easier and easier to fit them in to the remaining grids. And the circled cells in that puzzle, there were only, oh no, there were quite a few, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and it turned out that they fitted into this puzzle called schismatic nominoes, and they fitted in very neatly into this. This is an irregular, Sudoku and we'll take it back to this is how it looked once the blue digits were added in from the um, previous puzzle and this is a classic um, irregular if you've solved these they're not this one's not too bad if you're not used to irregular it can really mess with you a bit so this two is clearly ruled out of all of these cells because they're in the same column but it has to be in this shape somewhere. So it has to fit in there, for instance. Again, I'm really not going to um, try and solve this puzzle, but I would next look for where can a seven go in one of those four cells. And it's actually ruled out of three of them by what we've been given. So that's achievable. To some extent, you have to pick off cells one at a time when you're starting one of these puzzles, but gradually they build up to something. And then there are patterns to notice. So for instance, this top row, six of the digits are in this shape and the other three in a different one. Now those other three, where are they going to go in this shape? They clearly have to go down here. So you immediately know that seven and nine must be in these three. You can fill in seven and put nine in one of those and you've got a decent start. In the same way, um, is that wrong? Have I done something wrong? I'm not sure. So yes, I have that. That was a seven. So my, let's get, just go back a bit. I do apologize. My, I was trying to work out where you put a seven and I made a very false conclusion and put a seven in here where it can't be because of that. The seven in this column actually has to be there. So I do apologize about that. This becomes the four. Um, these aren't, oh yeah, that's an eight because there's a three already in the shape and that's a three. So again, this idea seven and nine have to be here. So now actually sevens in one of those, nines in one of the others. And now you have seven, one, eight, nine in this shape in column two. That shape fills most of column one. Where does seven, one, eight, nine go in column one? Well, they have to be up here. So now you know that's an eight, nine pair. Um, and that's how the solution to this puzzle would go. Hopefully you wouldn't make, oh look, there's a naked single. That's a five. Hopefully you wouldn't make the sort of mistake I made at the beginning. Um, and you could carry on until the solution. This one wasn't too hard, as I say, depending on how familiar you are, you are with irregular Sudoku. Now, where did that take us? We got quite a few highlighted numbers in this, and we've only got three more puzzles to fit them in. Uh, one of which is that really remarkable looking hypocrisy, which has almost no givens. 
And when we take it back to the sheet, it turns out that the next puzzle where we can apply these and have something we can work on is this hostile killer. So when we fill in the digits into the hostile killer puzzle, this is what we end up with. We've got a killer Sudoku, a partial killer Sudoku. Some of the cages are done and sorry, some of the digits are in cages, others aren't. And it's also a diagonal puzzle. So it's a diagonal killer. And that's basically the rules here. The, the, some, the digits in the cages have to all be different and some to the number given. So um, this one starts quite interestingly. You've got nine here, which is can't possibly be in the 17 shape because nine requires another eight and you can't do that in four different digits. So nine doesn't appear in those cells in the central box because it's on the diagonal, it doesn't appear in those. Therefore, it is on the diagonal going the other way. And that's kind of restricting a lot of where you can put it elsewhere. Now, eight is not on the diagonal on this diagonal in that box or in this box. It must be on the diagonal in this box. And again, it can't be in the middle. It's on the diagonal. So now you've got an eight, nine pair in this um, central box. And that's quite interesting. Now up here, We've got a 27 cage with a five already in it. The other three must be 22, which can normally only be 985. That's not possible, so it must be 976. Now you've got a nine here, a nine somewhere here. You've got to put a nine up here, but it's clearly already on this diagonal, so it can't be here. So you can make some progress early on if you can spot the things like that. Down here, there's a 21 cage. The only way that can't have a nine in it is if it's eight, seven, six, which is impossible because of that eight. So there must be a nine in that 21 cage. Now there's got to be a nine down here. Can't be on the diagonal because of that nine. So there's a nine in the box. And that's really restricting the possibilities for 30 in six digits. Once you've got a nine and a six, there's only so much more you can fit in. So. Those are some of the ways of going about getting started on this puzzle. Again, I'm not going to do the whole puzzle. You can try it if you want. Uh, just go to that Patreon document, click on the right link. And what you'll finish with, if you get it correct, is this grid. And we've only got two puzzles left to apply this to. One of them is that impossible looking hypocrisy. So let's try applying it to forged letters, which looks like this in the document. Now this had a lot of rules, a lot of text, um, a lot going on. They've got stars, hashtags, circles, and oh, no circles. That's quite interesting. First time we've had no circles. And we've got a queen rule applying to the number. Oh, in fact, each digit has been replaced by a letter. So you're theoretically meant to solve this with letters. The queen rule applies to the letter representing nine. Um, we know that queen rule well now. We've got thermos where digits must increase from the thermometer, from the bulb to the end. On this one, they kind of branch one way and then the other way. We've got some killer cages using colors and sandwich clues. So this is a real mix of everything we've been doing so far. And remember, we've got this coding for the letters. Now let's just flip to the app for or the website version. And this is the grid with a few of the numbers brought in from the previous puzzle. Now, this is a difficult puzzle. The way to approach it, I believe, is to start by thinking about these concatenated letter strings. So <coughs> what I mean by that is that this isn't algebra. You're not multiplying D by O. You're using D O as a two letter string to represent the sum of this five digit cage. So D could be as much as three, but it can't be four. Um, so you've got one, two or three for D. 
you've got NT in a seven cell cage here. So again, that's got to be, well, two or three. It can't be a one this time. And you've got AD and DE forming four cell cages here. So by now you know that A, N and D have to be one, two and three in some order and that N can't be one um, because of these sums. Again, the, the killer clues all begin with D or A as well, which adds to this belief that they are definitely some of the smaller numbers. And you've got a one, two, three triple here as a result because A, N and D are there. Now we worked out that N can't be one, so we could take that out of there. Three is clearly already in this column, so A can't be three. And if you gradually work on these possibilities, what you can come to is that D becomes one. It is difficult, this puzzle, by the way. You really have to do quite a bit of work around the possibilities here, as far as I remember. Um, D turns out to be one, A turns out to be two, and N turns out to be three. And Given that, you can make further deductions, especially about the cages. This cage is quite restricted. It, remember, it has to be seven separate digits as well as adding up to whatever 30-something NT is. And T has to be at least four. So this cage has to add to at least 34. It's already got only eight in it from three digits. So the other four have to add to at least 26, and therefore you know things like that they must include a nine and an eight. Um, and I think that's right, it might not be right, but anyway, you do know that there's a nine. Actually, they could be eight, seven, six, five, you don't, but you, you know they're quite big, and that really helps restrict other digits around. This thermometer turns out to be very useful, partly because you know that this number now has to be more than two or three. So that has to be four, five, or six. The two numbers above it in the same box, which can't be five, they now have to be at least six and seven. One could be an eight though. And then these numbers at the end have to be at least seven. So they have to be seven, eight, or nine. And you know there are gradual restrictions that get imposed. Now, as you solve this puzzle, you will find that one is D, two is A, three is N, T is four, E is five, I is six, um, F, where it appears here, is seven, so that gives us a three, four cage. Um, what do we then have? R, I suppose, is eight, which appears here in this sum, which is actually 18. And this sum, which is 28, 28 in there plus 13 in there means that one's a two, for instance. And O is nine, which always looked possible along here where you've got um, a sandwich sum between the nine and wherever the one is. It turns out to actually be here rather predictably on the bulb and the sandwich sum turns out to be six and three. So. That's what you get. Now, there are other things going on here. So you've found that one, two, three, four, five is D-A-N-T-I-F-R-O. Now there's this red arrow here with no explanation about it. And remember that puzzle hunts often don't explain everything. You just have to identify what's useful to you in solving the hunt. And it turns out that down this arrow, we get six, three, seven, five, eight, three, four. Now on the outsides of the arrow, there's a five and a two. But what is really interesting is translating these letters back from the code into letters, and they turn out to spell Inferno. And you may well have heard of Dante's Inferno. Dante is actually written here, Inferno is written down there. And this is a really big clue in this hunt. Now, as well as Dante and Inferno being spelt out in the grid, it's also worth looking at, first of all, let me just take out these numbers so we can see the letters in the grid. Um, there we go. So the letters in the grid are quite interesting because around the outside, let's go down the side, they spell O-drat-o-deer. Oh, oh, in the um, 
killer cages, they spell don't fear dead. And in the letters in the cells, it's I Dante. And now we've got this inferno down here. And those perceptive amongst you will realize this is obviously a reference to the medieval Italian poet Dante and his inferno, which referred to nine circles of hell. And it turns out that the order in which we've been doing the puzzles is of some relevance to Dante's nine circles of hell. You can look it up on Wikipedia and the circles of hell are limbo, number one, and we had it's up in the air. And if something is in limbo, it's considered to be up in the air. For circle number two is lust, which relates to lascivious queens. Three is gluttony, which relates to hungry for sandwiches. Four is greed, which clearly relates to over greedy. Five is anger, which relates to a raging temperature. Six is heresy, which was the schismatic nonominos puzzle. Seven is violence, which is hostile killer. Eight is fraud, which is this forged letters puzzle. And that takes us on to the ninth circle of hell, which is treachery. Now that is the only remaining puzzle here. And what sort of treachery is going on in this hypocrisy puzzle. Now we do get some help from the from the instructions. The green cells decoded according to the previous puzzle describe which single cell in each row of the grid to consider cycling where necessary. Each such cell indicates a letter in one of the puzzle's titles with the rows of the grid mapped to the puzzles as guided by the blue cells. But what we're not getting is any given digits in the grid. And that's really surprising. If we look at this forged letter puzzle, there were no circled letters. We're not being given anything. So now what you had to do at this point, you might want to remember the clue about the hashtagged letters, or that, sorry, the hashtag cells, which began um, back at the beginning. It, we, it originally told us in each puzzle, one cell's marked with a hashtag, contents of these cells provide an additional hint to the theme. Now you could have worked this before now, but once you've found this code from forged letters, you can go through the puzzles in order, starting with it's up in the air, where the hashtag cell was a one. And according to the code, that is, is that right? I think it was a one. According to the code, that makes the letter A, or I might have done something wrong there. But what the what the uh, puzzles gave you was an A in the first puzzle. Um, in the second puzzle, the lascivious queens, there were two hashtags marked, and those two letters next to each other were one and two. Now, oh yes, sorry. What? I, sorry, it's not it's not the code from the Dante puzzle. Don't be fooled by that, because that doesn't spell anything useful. It's alphanumeric, so you get a 1 here, and that gives you an A. In Lascivious Queens, you get 1, 2, and that's 12. It told you to read them together. Now, that wouldn't apply to the code in the Forged Letters puzzle, so that's the clue that we're looking at alphanumeric. So you get A, L, and as you go through the puzzles, you get A, L, I, G, H, E, um, then you get to the forged letter puzzle where this, what is the solution to that? It's an eight, which would apparently give you um, an H in alphanumerics. But remember, we were meant to solve this puzzle as letters. And in fact, in the code, therefore, it was an R. And gradually, you've spelt out Alighieri, which is Dante's last name. So you kind of know that this puzzle is going to have a nine here to give you an I. And that's really neat, but that's only one given digit. How on earth are you going to fill this puzzle with some givens? Well, look at this little star. Normal Sudoku rules apply star. And just as the guy in the comments and several others in the comments before Everybody's been wondering, what are these starred cells in the grids? They haven't been referred to ever. There's starred cells in every grid or almost every grid. 
And what you might realize when you get to this point, when you need givens for a puzzle, you've got no circled cells. Well, how about trying all of the starred cells? And if you look at them, none of them appear in the same cells in different puzzles. And once you fill in all the digits that were in starred cells in various puzzles into this final grid, what you get is this grid, which is a mirror symmetrical set of givens for a classic Sudoku. And that's a really neat way of giving you the cells without actually telling you how you're getting them. Um, what is also neat about this is you need every single one of the puzzles to supply some starred cells, otherwise this final puzzle isn't solvable. But it is, in the end, a classic Sudoku. When you've solved it, we can look at the green and blue lines uh, and use the instructions. And it's a, quite a tricky classic, to be fair. It's a really nice puzzle. Again, I'm still not going to solve that one for you, but the solution looks like this. Now, we nip back to the instructions, which were, what did they say? The green cells decoded according to the previous puzzle. That was the coding puzzle. Describe which single cell in each row of the grid to consider cycling where necessary. Well, we don't know what that means yet, but let's translate the green cells and as guided by the blue cells. So we'll translate them as well. And the way that these translate according to the code is after one and in order. Okay, so what does that mean in the context? So the green cells decoded according to the previous puzzle. So after one describes which single cell in each row of the grid to consider, cycling when necessary. So we need to consider each row of the grid, and it turns out that's talking about this grid, and the digit after one in each row. Each such cell indicates a letter in one of the puzzle's titles with the rows of the grid mapped to the puzzles in order. So the solution requires us to take the letter after one in each cell. So here, one and then five, one and then nine, one and then five, one. Now this is where we're cycling where necessary. We're cycling around to the beginning of the row and we get the five, one and three, one and eight, one and two, one and three, one and two. And that's giving us five, nine, five, five, three, eight, two, three, two. Now we're meant to apply these letters to the puzzle titles in order. And those started with it's up in the air. So how do we apply five to it's up in the air? Well, a very standard thing in puzzle hunts is to key into a word or phrase using a number or other indicator. So let's key into it's up in the air with the number five. That means taking the fifth letter and that gives us a P. And as we go through the puzzles, we get P from the first one. U is the ninth letter of lascivious. So P, U, R from hungry, G from over greedy, A from a raging, T from schismatic, O from hostile, R from forged, and Y from this one, hypocrisy. And that spells out purgatory, which is, of course, a part of the whole of the Dante um, Nine Circles of Hell vision that he originally took us through. Now, other clues involved are that um, this is called a guide to your journey. If you're very well read, you'll know that Virgil apparently guided Dante through his journey through the nine circles of hell. So that's useful. We were looking for a nine letter English word that is purgatory. And that is the answer to the puzzle hunt. It was a fantastic compilation by Ben Needham. I know that uh, Simon and Neil Talbot on our team both worked together on it with him to kind of make it absolutely perfect in the finish. And I think it worked really well. It was difficult. Some of the puzzles were very difficult. Some of the application 
of what instructions there were was certainly very difficult. It was clearly difficult to um, achieve understanding how the, how the hashtags worked and very much how the stars worked to do the final puzzle. But in the end, for a number of people, this was very rewarding. And I'm going to put up um, in the description of this video the names, as far as we know them, of all the people who sent in the correct answer to applaud them for their absolute dedication to this puzzle hunt. The reviews were fabulous. Anybody who finished it loved it. Didn't surprise me at all. I did it, I solved it myself um, in exactly this final format and I thought it was wonderful. I was very lucky. I made quite considerable progress on the code puzzle and worked out from that that this was the whole hunt was revolving around Dante's Inferno. So I was able to order the puzzles immediately, uh, which certainly helped with the deductive process. Now you didn't need to do that. You could work out which puzzle led on to which puzzle, but it was certainly helpful to be guided by the titles and uh, that was very useful to me. But brilliant puzzle hunt. I really hope you enjoyed it as much as we enjoyed bringing it to you. And thank you very much for sitting through this video and uh, getting to the end of the hunt with me. I hope it wasn't purgatory for you. Um, hope to see you again soon on Cracking the Cryptic. Bye for now.